Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. A little later in the program, we're gonna take a look at the political consequences and fallout of the fires in Colorado Springs with Wayne Logason of the Colorado Springs Gazette. But first, we're still not done talking about what Supreme Court did to us. I mean, did to us a couple of weeks ago. My colleague from the Independence Institute, Rob Nadelson, thanks for joining us. It's great to be back. All right, first, the shameless plug. Yes. The original Constitution, what it actually said and meant, available in fine bookstores everywhere, but there are no pictures at, at, at all in it. <laughs> um, you, you've been uh, working on, the, on constitutional studies as a law professor and as someone, along with Dave Kopel, who put in a couple of meekest briefs to the Supreme Court decision. And while people who feel like I do that this is blatantly unconstitutional were very disappointed, there's still a couple real bright sides out of this, especially for what you did in this case. Yeah, the bottom line of it, uh, regarding this decision is it wasn't great by any means, but there were some silver linings. Uh, one is that a majority of the court held that Obamacare was not justified by the commerce power, neither by the clause that gives co Congress the power to regulate commerce among the several states, and this, nor, this, this nor is... by the necessary and proper clause. Right. And uh, also the, um, uh, the decision gives the states a lot more flexibility on the Medicaid expansion. But in, in particular, you and Dave Kopel, your colleague, put together a couple amicus briefs, which are a friend of the court briefs. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, really there weren't too many of these that brought up issues on Medicaid and proper, uh, necessary and proper. So let, let's, let's take it in that order. You had a real success in necessary and proper. If I understand this, and I'm just a layman on it, the, the, the Constitution says uh, Congress has the power to do anything that is necessary and proper to follow out what's in the Constitution. Uh, so it can coin money and have post offices, so it gets to do all the ancillary things to make that make that so. How did that apply to health care? You know, an important word you just said is ancillary, uh, subsidiary. The purpose of the necessary and proper clause is to make it clear that that Congress, in the course of carrying out its other powers, can do certain lesser things, like uh, in regulating commerce, it can require proper labeling. But what's happened over the years is the necessary and proper clause has been held by the Supreme Court to be this huge reservoir of new federal power. You know, the power to regulate the environment, to regulate manufacturing, to regulate agriculture, all under the necessary and proper clause. Based on research that I had done with several other scholars, we um, uh, wrote this brief to the court explaining that the necessary and proper clause is actually not supposed to give Congress any additional power, and it, it simply tells the reader how to read the Constitution. And what was wonderful is that, in his opinion, Chief Justice Roberts tracks many of the same sources that we cited to the court. So we have pretty good reason to believe that our brief did have an impact in the, uh, the whittling down or shaving back of the necessary and proper clause. Talk to me a little bit about the Medicaid part. You, you did two briefs, one on necessary and proper, and that seems to have been well mm -hmm. read and, and used in the final, uh, final verdict. What about... Medicaid, what was the argument there? And this was a sizable win. What the Obamacare legislation said is that any state that does not go along with a gargantuan, that means really big, uh, increase in Medicaid uh, will have all of its Medicaid funds pulled, not just for the new expansion, but all the prior funds as well. Now, since states... And, and no state has to be involved with Medicaid. Technically... Nobody they, needs to take Medicaid, right? Technically, they don't. But in the years since 1965, it has, like other health care programs, gotten so big that it is now a major part of any state's budget. So if Congress succeeded in pulling the funds from any state, it could either bankrupt the state or force massive tax increases within the state. Unfortunately, uh, the Supreme Court had never before held a condition like that to be unconstitutional. Dave Copo and I at the Independence Institute saw an opening there that most people didn't seem to see. We thought it was unconstitutional. We wrote this amicus curiae, a friend of the court brief, arguing that, and we won by a margin of seven to two. Seven to two seven on to two. that, that That's issue. That's right. Interestingly enough, Elena Kagan, uh, President Obama's most recent appointment and a former member of his administration sided with us. 
She sided with the opinion that said that this attempt by Congress to coerce the states was nothing more than a gun to the head, that's the word used, and unconstitutional. All right, then let's go to the issue where we lost and we lost big. And why didn't you write something on this part of it? Maybe we would have won that. And that's that this is a taxing authority. And it's amazing. I've gone back to the YouTube is so wonderful. You go back and you find all the clips of, of the president saying this is not a tax. His uh, minions in front of congressional hearings, no, this is not a tax. This is not a tax. Then when they get to the Supreme Court, one of the arguments is, well, it's, it's a tax. And Congress, right there in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, says, you know, they have the, they have the power to tax. That's all we're doing. Yeah, the taxing power in some ways is broader than the commerce power, and so the Obama administration argued it, despite its previous assurances. And five members of the court decided that it was a tax. Specifically, the penalty paid if you don't have insurance was a tax. It was a tax on not being insured. I agree with you, John. I wish we had written on that subject because that was probably the weakest part of Justice Roberts' opinion. Uh, he's simply wrong on that issue, and he's also wrong on the kind of tax it is, if in fact it is a tax. Well, it, it is a tax. I mean, by law now, can't yeah, we say law, it's, yeah. a, it's a tax. Yeah, yeah. Obama might want to call it, not want to call it a tax. It's a tax. And it's a tax on the middle class. Most of the money is going to come from people who make far under uh, $250,000. But I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around. So, so are a lot of other people, that, I, especially since if this were a tax, technically the court should not have assumed jurisdiction at all because there's a statute which says that normally when somebody challenges a tax, he can't challenge it until he's already paid it and he seeks a refund. The court said it's not a tax for that statute and then went, it on, went on and said for constitutional purposes, we'll uphold it as a tax. Wait a second, because this, yeah. is, this is just bend in my, bend in my brain. Well, that's what the so, dissent said. They had bent their brains, too. So they're saying, <laughs> usually when I sue, and by the way, I've been on those lawsuits. I've been a plaintiff suing the state on many tax increases. And, and what I've said is, I'm a, I'm a taxpayer, therefore I have standing, mm -hmm. and I've paid this tax, and I paid it unfairly. That no longer holds with this because they struck down that ability to do it. Well, on the Again, on a federal tax, there's an old statute which says that you cannot challenge the validity of a federal tax until you've already paid it and you seek a refund. Court says it's not a tax for that purpose. But then they say whether it's a tax for constitutional purposes is a different matter. We think this is a tax for constitutional purposes. Again, they're, I think they're wrong about that because a tax is for the production of revenue. Uh, the founding era record regarding the meaning of tax in the Constitution is really clear on that point. But, John, even if it is a tax, it's that type of tax which the Constitution calls a direct tax and has to be apportioned among the states in the statute, and that never happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Remember, you're talking to a guy who, who had crib notes going through college right there. <laughs> so help me, help me out. A direct tax compared to it, this was declared an indirect tax. A direct tax means? It basically, a direct tax is a tax on earning a living or just existing. And this is, an, this is a direct tax because if you're sitting in your living room, not doing, not any. doing anything and you're being taxed, that, that's a direct tax. It's, a, it, it, it's legitimate if it's a portion among the states, but that um, a that portion of among the states meaning you have this percentage of population, that means you have to have the same That's percentage right. of the tax revenue coming from your state. That's right. Now, some of, your, some of your viewers may say, hey, wait a minute, wasn't that changed by the 16th Amendment? All the 16th Amendment said was that one particular kind of direct tax, the income tax, is, doesn't have to be a portion, but all the this others is, do. This is, this is my show. This my viewers don't even know there was a 16th Amendment. <laughs> and it, sorry. Let, let me ask you about the, the culture of this because... We forget that these justices, they're just guys, they're just gals, and they've got the same sort of social pressures and see the reality from that little bubble mm -hmm. in, in D.C. I'm looking at this, and I've got to ask a question. Reports show that Justice Roberts first joined the conservatives in this and said no, and then later was somehow convinced. Was there some magical argument that popped out? Was there something that he didn't realize and all the precedent of law? Or why is it that 
President Obama started screaming about a activist court and pressure started to build and he's changed his mind. Is, is, there, yeah, well, is there pressure among even justices? The Constitution has it so you think there'd be no pressure. They're, they're elected for life. They get paid no matter what they do. They shouldn't have any influence at all. I don't know why Justice Roberts decided the way he did, but I can tell you there is a very long history uh, of it, more than half a century of supposedly conservative Republicans being appointed to the court and then flipping over to the liberal side. We've seen this again and again. We have not seen a comparable shift by Democratic appointees going over to the conservative side. Many people think, think it has to do with the particular kinds of social pressures that exist in Washington, D.C., which is one reason why I think we need to move the court to Denver. <laughs> When you say social pressures, though, what, what kind of social pressures? Well, I mean, it's, not like they, it's not like they get elected. It's not like they have to go out and I campaign. Know. You know, what they do, they do in, in the back room. There's, there's no open meetings law. We don't see how they decide. So I can't imagine the pressure. What kind of pressure do you if, mean? If you're a Supreme Court justice, you're going to serve for life until retirement. You're going to live within Washington, D.C. You're going to associate with, some kind of, with certain kinds of people. You're going to read certain kinds of newspapers, be exposed to... Um, uh, a certain subset of ideas. Uh, over time, the effect has been that supposedly conservative lawyers who get appointed to the Supreme Court very often move to the left. So, uh, Is this uh, just Georgetown yeah. cocktail parties? That well, that, that's you know, a shorthand. You've for got it, you've yeah. got you've got justices who still have to go to King Supers or whatever the variant is mm -hmm. in, in Virginia and their kids go to school or the kids go to college the wife is involved in in whatever clubs and they they have to go out and see these people who who are not like people in Colorado I mean you've been to DC it is a whole universe unto itself I mean DC is to the rest of the United States as you know the Boulder CU campus is to the rest of Colorado it's it's its own little reality and does that does that is, is that one of those reasons? And if so, I, I can think, you ever prove it? I think that I think that is a reason. And uh, a, a good counterexample is Justice Thomas, who was a constitutional judge when he got appointed and remains one today. And all the reports of Justice Thomas are he goes to work, he goes home, and he pretty much stays there. He does not participate in the, in the D.C. social scene. A uh, conspicuous exception is Justice Scalia, who not only participates in the social scene, but has also remained a rock-ribbed rock traditional judge. But in many cases, we have seen Republican appointees move left, sometimes far to the left. It just seems to be a reality. Rob Nagelson, thank you. The original Constitution, go to Amazon.com, pick up one. Uh, trust me, this is some good stuff. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.